webinar is Let's Look for the Silver Lining Using Evidence-Based Practices for Remote Healthcare, presented by Michelle Drafton. Today's webinar is brought to you by the Great Lakes ATTC, PTTC, MHTTC, and SAMHSA. A little bit about us, the Great Lakes ATTC, MHTTC, and PTTC are funded by the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration. We are supported by these cooperative agreements. And just a few housekeeping details. Today's webinar will be recorded and will be available on the Great Lakes MHTTC website and the Great Lakes current YouTube channel. There are no CEUs or attendance certificates for this webinar. Please send general questions um, regarding online resources to the Great Lakes MHTTC. Please put all of your questions for today's webinar in the chat box. Please follow us on social media. And I'm happy to present our presenter today, Dr. Michelle Drapkin. Dr. Drapkin received her PhD from Rutgers, the State University of New Jersey, and completed her clinical psychology internship and postdoctoral fellowship in treatment outcomes research at the University of California, San Diego, VA San Diego. She has professional experience in a variety of settings. She was on faculty at the University of Pennsylvania, has worked nationally at the Department of Veterans Affairs, was a director of training at Rutgers, and spent the last couple of years in the private sector working as a behavior scientist at Johnson & Johnson and at a Silicon Valley startup, Better Up. She is a longtime member of the Motivational Interviewing Network of Trainers and is sought out for consultation and training globally. Welcome and thank you. Thank you for having me. Um, and so I, um, I'm excited to be here and you know, wish it was under better circumstances, right? But part of that's actually part of why we're here is to talk about the silver linings of what we're the epidemic that we're in now and of doing remote telehealth, which we're all um, in, the, in, in the position of doing. And so actually that's kind of where I wanted to start and Laura, I'll give you a chance to um, introduce yourself as well. But part of what I've been doing over the last uh, three plus years is I've had a small private practice in my um, small town outside of New York City um, and doing that mostly Saturday mornings and more often now than I had before. And so I am probably like many of you, I'm reporting in from where I do therapy right here in my home in New Jersey in this chair um, and doing that very intentionally. Um, and so I, I'm in it with you, right? Um, you know, as we like to say, we're all in this suit together and, um, and can talk to you about um, that piece. I also, you know, um, you know, thank you for the great introduction and, knowing that piece of that is some of the research I've done is actually in delivering um, telehealth, which used to be back in the day, mostly telephone, but we can talk about now the real value of using video. And so hopefully you can see me here on screen, um, you know, which comes with a little bit, it's always a mixed bag because I can see myself too. And I'm always wondering, what do I look like? Um, and we'll talk about some of those challenges too. But Laura, do you want to take a second to say hello and introduce yourself as well? Yeah. Yeah, so I'm uh, Laura Saunders. I'm the uh, state program co coordinator for the state of Wisconsin for all three of the centers that Ann mentioned earlier, the Great Lakes Mental Health, Great Lakes Prevention, and Great Lakes Addiction Technology Transfer Centers. And I wanted to, I invited uh, Dr. Drapkin here today because through my conversations with her on some other projects, we're both uh, motivational interviewing network trainers, um, I realized that she is not just somebody who has expertise talking about evidence-based practices and using evidence-based practices, but has actually been using those evidence-based practices in her work. And so today, I, so I felt like, well, I could talk about motivational interviewing and how it's supposed to work um, in a telehealth situation. She's really uh, actually doing the work. So that's why I invited her and her expertise here today. Um, 
what I'm hoping for is, is that she can lend you her experience, her expertise, and that you can marry that with your experience and your expertise so that you can feel uh, a little bit reassured about this brave new world that you have been just absolutely, I don't, you certainly weren't invited into it. You were, you were uh, pushed into this new world. So that's what I wanted this session to help uh, smooth that immediate or that uh, that push so thanks Michelle yeah and so here here we are to talk about um, you know and we intentionally when Laura and I started to conceptualize uh, this workshop webinar we, we really we were thinking about and it actually came up really kind of naturally in one of our peer consultation groups that we're having with other motivational interview trainers about the silver linings of telehealth that um, you know as Laura just elegantly said like we were all thrust into this environment and doing this full time like the rest of the world. Um, and initially you might have been pretty dis disappointed or dismayed. And the reality is we're finding some really nice silver linings that we're not here to, you know, be Pollyannas and say that this is amazing and this is so great and there's there's no challenges about it. We're going to talk about both sides of it, but really trying to look through like how how does this improve um, access to care um, and how you know and how to make it work right because it isn't something that we probably most of us have been doing for a while um the one thing else i want really want to make sure to say is that um you know laura and i are both uh motivational learning trainings trainers which means we're super collaborative and we want you to be to show up in this webinar as much as we are um uh, i um i was gonna say he and probably it's about the right word i i, I just like nothing more than talking at a screen <laughs> alone um i'm so glad to have laura there um, but but please, like we want you to contribute. We want you to use the chat box. I have it right here on my iPad, so I can try and look down and see it. But if I'm missing something, Laura will um, help me out and make sure that I'm also getting um, what you're saying. And so there'll be times where we'll ask you to contribute. And so I hope you're you're present and with us. Um, so actually, that's a great place to start. Oh, I went ahead too far. Um, so let's start by just kind of grounding in. Why are we all here? Um, and I mean, literally here on this webinar, but I also, you know, what sort of brought you to the field of the helping professional field um, and really thinking about, and so I just want you to take a second um, and, and really just, you can close your eyes if you want, but just take a moment and be one-minded. And I want you to really think about why you became a helping professional. Um, so for me, why I became a psychologist, why you chose to go to grad school, why you chose to work in the field. Think about what it was that brought you there and why you do this work that we all know is quite challenging and difficult, exhausting at times, and we're motivated to do it. What's your purpose? What's your passion? What brought you here? And just take a second. You can even write it down if you want to really just capture it. And I'm wondering if there's anyone on the line who either um, wants to unmute if they're able, I think they're able to do that hopefully, or wants to put it in the chat box of, you know, what, what's your story? Like, why did you become a helping professional? Christina, are they able to unmute themselves? I forgot to ask that. I just went ahead and unmuted everybody. So um, once we're done talking, I'll just kind of wait for um, verbal cues from you, Michelle, just so that I can mute and okay. unmute the whole group. Yep, and I see that, thank you for those of you that are, um, you know, that are popping in here. Um, so yep. it's your calling, you wanted to help others, does someone else want it now that you're off mute? Does anyone want to speak up on the line? So this is a cool one. My her best friend's mom talking about being a child and youth social worker, helping other families who had similar issues and, in the family, make a difference. Yeah. Lots yeah. of lots of it sounding like it was a calling or like something that just kind of landed in their lap and was 
became a passion. Yeah, and I see breaking down the stigma, um, someone's ex-fiance overdose, which is always a really, you know, meaningful experience that kind of launches you into wanting to help other people. And a lot of it, you know, um, you know, oh, and I'm sorry, is Marlene wanting to speak up? Oh, well, you said voice and then everybody went to typing. So. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> Go ahead, Marlene. <laughs> Just thinking that I hear this from a lot of my staff, but in addition, this is my reason. Um, because as a child growing up, you know, poor and kind of a product of our environment, um, it was always, or the idea was impressed that we weren't, we weren't the people who could help. We were the people who needed help. And so for me, it's about, it's a validation. It's a point of, I was a recipient and I want to give back and, by giving back, it's not just, here's a check of $500. It's more so, I understand where you came from, where you're at, and I want to help you get over that hump because I know it's possible. So that's what brought me to this field, and it keeps me motivated every day, especially during these times where it's so easy to kind of I'm I'm so grateful you spoke up because that's exactly where I was going, right? Is that part of part of what brought us to the field is what keeps us in it and keeps us motivated every day um, and really stopping and connecting with um, why we're here, why we show up and how we can do that remotely. Um, and that's what gets me up and out of bed every day and into this corner where I sit. Um, and, you know, we can talk about how, <laughs> how I don't sit in the corner all day. I get up and move around, but it's what gets me here. Um, did I choose to sit here? No. Um, would I prefer to see my patients in person for the most part? Yes. And and there's lots of great things that are coming out of really being able to do remote work and still live into my values and my sense of purpose. You know, and for me, what I'll share is part of my purpose is not just helping people, but I like to help those who are helping other people. And so I call it like meta helping, which is part of why I'm here today is I'm really excited about being able to help you all. And it's what keeps me inspired and motivated, Marlene, just like you were saying, right? Like I really, um, I think that's the piece of it is how do we stay connected with the true sense of our purpose? And even if it's starting to look a little bit different than we initially intended, right? And so it's, it, we could still do the good work. So everything that you guys are writing down um, even eliminating stigma, right, which is something I'm really passionate about, we can still do that from the corners of our room, right? Um, in fact, our jobs are about to become, I think, even more important than they ever were before. Um, and we can access more people and touch more lives um, from the corners of our rooms or wherever you're, you're currently practicing. Um, so thank you all for sharing that. Um, one of the other things we want to talk about is how, you know, Um, for sure. And so one of the things you'll notice is, um, you know, we're, we're all for the most part in our homes and working from our homes. I don't know if some of you are still, um, I do know some clinicians are still going to their private practice offices or their space, their workspaces, even though patients aren't coming in, they're, they're making their telehealth calls from their offices. But for the most part, most of us are doing it from home. And so one of the things you'll see, um, and so let's talk about um, some of the sort of the ground rules or the basic pieces of how we're making this happen. And I, and again, I want this to be collaborative. And so Laura and I sort of brainstormed on some of this, but I think that um, you guys will probably have a lot more to offer too. So let, let's like think about this whole workshop as us all coming together and coming up with some best practices and some stories where we can all learn and grow from this. Um, so one thing is, you know, making sure the cam where you have the camera positioned. Um, I use my MacBook. Um, and so that's why I have this this is my this is my latest thing is learning how to use my iPad Pro as a sidecar. <laughs> this is what it's called, so that I can have an additional um, monitor like in my lap. I, I'm a big Apple Mac person, but making sure the camera is that so it, hopefully it looks like I'm looking at you, I'm talking to you. Um, even if I have a couple and I do do some couples work, I'm still like looking at the camera and trying to really pivot so that it feels like we're connected. Um, that's one one piece. The other thing that we were talking about is when you're doing telehealth, um, and that's assuming you're on video, we could also talk about 
what to do with the phone, but assuming either video or phone is keeping your hands busy so that you don't find yourself mindlessly doing something that's distracting. Um, and I find, like, frankly, for me, this is probably, I, I might put this at the top of the list for the challenges of telehealth, is it is, it is much harder for me to stay one-minded and present with my patients than it ever was before, because they're not sitting in front of me. Um, and so sitting in front of me is my iPad Pro, which is always on my lap, but now they can't see at all what's on it. And so potentially I might, you know, I don't know, something might come through and I might find myself being mindless instead of mindful and present with my patients. My phone is also right here. Um, and so if a text message or something comes through, I might find myself looking at it because my schema for doing phone calls or video sessions is or video isn't always with a patient where I need to be one minded and present. In fact, I spent a lot of my career in corporate America or working remotely where you're actually encouraged to multitask for better or for worse. <laughs> um, but what I'll tell you is that a, as a clinician, I bet you guys struggle with this, right? Is that it's, you can't be as effective as a clinician when you're multitasking, right? You, in fact, as an MI practitioner, right? A lot of what we're doing is listening very intently to what people say. And so if I get distracted, even by a text message coming in, I've missed the flow of what's going on and I might've missed some key words or some important motivators. So trying to keep yourself as present and one-minded as possible. Um, and I'm, I'm wondering if anyone has any um, ideas about how do you stay present and really like focused during your sessions, what's really worked well for you all? And you can type it in the chat box. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll take I'm, I'm being fair. Okay, yeah, thank yeah, thanks, I'm Laura. On taking notes, turning off the email, moving the phone, having a designated workspace. Earlier in the conversation, I don't know if you saw this, Michelle, that uh, Sarah indicated that she has set a place in her home that she doesn't use for anything else. It's specifically for seeing clients. She's like set up that boundary. Oh, that's great. Making sure the Zoom fills up the whole that's screen so nothing else can show. That's a great idea. <laughs> that is a great idea. And I mean, and these are the things that like, I know you guys are using your computers for things other than telehealth, right? And so you might have had stuff open, even if it's like Facebook or LinkedIn and you're kind of playing around and then you start a session you might forget and then notifications are coming in or, um, you know, you were texting someone right before and then it comes into the session. Um, oh, I love um, Terry having resources nearby, CBT worksheets, videos, books, visual aids. I think that's a, that, you know, Terry, you're probably smarter than I am because it took me a few weeks to get there <laughs> um, to really set up my space so that I can easily access um, my favorite mindfulness interventions, and I have a bunch of books here that I often use. I practice, in addition to motivational interviewing, I practice a lot of evidence-based practices, CBT, CBT, all of it, um, including acceptance and commitment therapy. So I always have a lot of those resources very um, available. So that's, again, a smart thing. Um, and taking care of personal needs prior to session. Yeah, taking notes helps a lot too, right? Um, and so that's really great. You know, I, I don't, I'm not, um, I'm MI to the core. I use motivational learning a lot, so I'm not one to give advice. Um, but if you'll allow me here <laughs> um, a little bit, I would say video is going to be um, a lot easier, right, to maintain that contact and that connection than just telephone. I get it. It's not always possible depending on, and we can talk about um, privacy issues and all lots of stuff, reasons it's not always possible, but it, it, it all, possibilities. I always try video. And I had a patient who going into this, so, you know, I, you, you got to remember, I'm right outside of New York. So we're in sort of the hotbed of, um, of all of the COVID-19 stuff. And we, we started sheltering in place right around the same time as New York. Um, and it happened pretty quickly. Um, and so I had started to talk to patients, I think the week in advance, maybe even a few days in advance, I'd given them options. I said, I'll be in the office, but if you feel more comfortable, we can do telehealth. Um, and one of my patients was like, I'm coming in, there's no way I'm ever doing telehealth. Um, and then when the order came down that we had to stay at home and couldn't come in, I mean, you know, I'm considered, an, we're all considered essential. I could come in, but it just seemed like it, it didn't feel like I needed to. And so I talked with him. 
I said, would you be willing to try telehealth? And now he and I, we have weekly telehealth sessions and he's great. He'll talk to me about everything. Um, it, it's as if like we're sitting in the same room. Um, and so I think it's just, it's, it's about that willingness and um, to try it out. And for a lot of people, they're actually surprised at the level of rapport and connection you could have over video um, as opposed to in person. All right. So we are going to kind of walk through what Laura and I and our best, you know, brains and just kind of having lived through this came up with some hot button issues, but we're, we'll also encourage you to kind of jump in um, and, you know, add any other ideas or issues as we go through. But really thinking through, you know, what are some of the good things, the silver lining um, of doing telehealth? And then how do we problem solve around some of the, some of the not good so things, right? How do we kind of flip them on its head or co compensate for them because this is kind of the, um, the cards we've been dealt for right now? Laura, anything else before I no, I our I, list? Well, yeah, just if people want to just kind of chat in in the chat box, what you're seeing let's maybe we should just start with the good things should we do that first or should we do the not so good things yeah actually. <laughs> <laughs> or should we sandwich it <laughs> okay right, yeah should start with the good things double-sided sandwich whatever <laughs> yeah uh, actually let's let's start with like what what's the what's what's that your most favorite thing you've noticed since you've moved to telehealth like what has really jumped out at you and you're like oh my gosh I would have never like seen that coming but like this telehealth stuff is actually not so bad let's start with yeah. some of the like the really the surprising good thing yeah so kiddos who can make it because of trans they they didn't have transportation before now they can participate seeing clients in their homes especially with children the practitioner feels more organized gives us yeah. a unique view of the client yeah Actually, Michelle and I were talking about this. I'm a social worker, and so person and environment is something that tends to be a little bit more usual business for home visitors, for social workers, for people who do their work in the home. And a lot of uh, therapy is not done in the home previously. So this might be um, a new experience for some and a usual experience for others. Young clients being excited, easier to share. Maybe some anonymity or something. Yeah. Transportation. Wow, that keeps, yep. Captive audience and reachable. Family has more buy-in. High rate of Yeah, isn't, isn't that fascinating, right? Like that it's, it's um, even though, and I, I mean, I don't want to speak for all of us, but I certainly was a little bummed out when we went fully remote. Um, I love my private practice. I love my office. I love even the people in my building. Um, and I've been really pleasantly surprised um, by some of these same things too. Um, no show rate dropped, right? Like people are like, cause they don't need the, the commute is gone. Right. And um, you're meeting them in their home. There's a lot more flexibility. They don't have child, you know, childcare isn't an issue. Like, thankfully, like, so I'm a mom. Um, I have an eight year old who's downstairs right now, hopefully working on her homeschooling. Right. You know, and I could be here with you present. Um, my, my husband's also home in case of any emergencies, but you know, it's, it's amazing, right. How much, how effective we can be um, when we remove some of the barriers and telehealth really does that. Right. It meets people where they're at, which we'll talk about in a second. Um, oh, I love the um, being able to see here more organic relationships. I think that one is like gold, right. It is, so it is so gold, um, and we'll talk about that a little bit more too. So now before we move on and start kind of marching through some of our hot button issues, some of which you're, you're also hitting on, so it's nice, I feel, I don't know, Laura, about you, but I feel kind of validated that like this is stuff, these are all things that we also were talking about that came up um, and feel pretty universal. What are some of the challenges that you've seen? What are some of the problems that you need to solve around that maybe we can all kind of put our heads together as we go through this? So I, I love, and so go ahead and enter those in the chat box too, but the, um, yeah, that clients like to see you in your home with the dogs barking. Yes, I have, um, Laura and I both share, share this, but I, Laura has two dogs, I have three. Um, I have schnauzers who I love dearly, um, but the not 
not so good things about schnauzers is they're very barky. Um, and so, and my, I have a puppy, I have a nine month old puppy, um, and who loves to be with me. She's not with me now, or I'd bring her on camera to show you, but I have a bed right next to where I sit. Um, and so sometimes I'll bring her on camera and patients love that. Um, they, you know, they love, I, I'll, I'll be honest, I haven't, I, I won't, I keep my daughter far, far away from my sessions for privacy and all that, but my dog, <laughs> they're, they, uh, they're like little balls, so they're not going to talk to anyone. Um, yeah, I'm seeing that it's mentally exhausting, um, and yeah, some clients can't really do telehealth. Yeah, they don't have a space for it, right? Yep. Don't have, don't have yep. the, the smartphone, the computer. Stigma, clients and guardians constantly canceling. Yeah, I, and I love, so Melissa, like the, um, telling you, you know, tell people not to isolate. In fact, I, I just, uh, I was giving a talk on um, maintaining our own mental well-being last week, and I was talking about how as a psychologist, I'm always telling people that if you're afraid of something, you need to, like, expose yourself to it, right? So I have this great little meme about why did the chicken cross the road, and it's because my therapist told me I need to do more things that scare me, right? <laughs> um, and now I'm like, now it's like the opposite. We're telling everyone to shelter in place, stay home, keep yourself isolated, which is really tough for people in recovery, for sure. Um, and I think that's one of the things that um, we're, we're definitely seeing a lot of challenges there. Um, okay. I'm just trying to, exhausting. Yeah. There, uh, Parents interfere in a negative way. Yeah, therapeutic, um, count, therapeutic silence remotely is a, is a difference, yeah. Oh, Sherry, what a, what a genius observation, right? Because sometimes when, now when we're quiet, it's like people think, um, uh, people think we have challenges, right? Something is going on with my computer. Speaking of challenges. Okay, Let's see if I can get this, what's going on. I'll just read some answers here for a while. So, um, Zoom Thanks. crashes, <laughs> people think that we're not engaged when we're seeing them. Um, people who are, who are a bit hyper or more, act, you know, physically active or their minds are more active, having trouble staying focused, which is distracting. Yep. Okay. I think I got us ahead. Did that work? You just went to the next slide, Michelle. All right, perfect. So it's good enough for now. It's my yeah. computer's doing something about verifying. Um, so, so okay. speaking of like challenges related to telehealth, sometimes our computers um, kind of take over, right? And um, and so if if you do have, so this is what I wanted to do is just really stop and say, like, listen, we as we go into this, we are trained. Most of us are trained for the most part to deliver interventions in person, right? That's like. You know, I'm a psychologist. I've had tons of training where people tape me, watch me, I do groups. Everything was, for the most part, in person. I did do some telephone monitoring and adaptive counseling when I was on faculty at University of Pennsylvania. So I did get a little bit of a taste for that. Um, and I certainly have worked remotely for a big part of my career. But what I really wanted to reassure you, in case you haven't looked at the literature, I've looked at the literature both back then and then more recently, it's pretty clear that telehealth and in-person are equivalent, which I don't know how you feel hearing that. Um, I feel a little ambivalent um, hearing that, but for sure, it's the, the data are pretty clear. In fact, um, the, the latest research that I was reading was actually kind of interesting where they looked at it was kind of a review or a meta-analysis of telehealth versus in-person. And what they found was actually clinicians, us, we were more suspicious and believed in telehealth less than patients, right? So we sort of might have gotten our own ways a little bit of really thinking through that, oh, this doesn't really work as well. It's not as good. Um, and so we, and, and that, you know, I don't know how many, we just talked a lot about being exhausted. I don't know how many of you have been feeling exhausted. I for sure have. And I've looked up, wh why am I so exhausted? <laughs> what is this about? Um, and there's some research that shows that, um, you know, some of the exhaustion is actually the mindset that we're bringing into it, that we don't, that we've been forced to do this, right? And so this isn't what, what we want to do. It's not our choice. And so there's a piece of this of, ugh, as I sit down for the beginning of the day, it's like, uh, here we go. Um, and so thinking through, well, 
and I, I have to catch my thoughts and say that and think, yeah, here we go. I get to meet my patients where they're at. I get to help them. Um, and I, I can lean back in the research and realize that, yes, there's, there may be some ways I need to pivot and change what I'm doing. And they're still getting access to care when they need it. Um, and so today's Monday. I don't do a ton of clinical work on Mondays, but I did see one patient who is in high risk for I do I do do still some clinical work for addictions and she's high risk for relapse is trying to but so here I am in her apartment with her talking through thinking through you know looking at her apartment with her thinking of all of the stuff that she needs to get through maybe even helping her get rid of some of the high risk material that she has around um, and so I'm like literally in it with her whereas if I didn't have access to do that via telehealth she'd be on her own and she might be out using again and in trouble. Um, and so there's some real benefits to doing it. And I can lean as a scientist, I can lean back in the efficacy and really exhale and think about, okay, I'm, I'm able to do some good work. And all of a sudden now I have a stance of gratitude as opposed to feeling like not so great about it. Um, all right. Oh, I thought it is difficult to assess for safety. Um, and Manuel, I can provide some resources and references for sure. All right. So here, here's one that um, I don't know how many of you have initiated new patients during the last couple months. So I'm, so I don't know. You guys are. It looked like uh, when you were kind of signing in, you're all over the country, which is fantastic. We've been sheltering in place. This is week nine. Not that I'm keeping count. Um, but it is, it is week nine. And I'll tell you, when I moved my practice to fully um, online, full telehealth, I was, I said to myself, there is no way I'm gonna take new patients. I can do this telehealth thing. I feel really comfortable about it, especially people, and even going back to the safety thing, um, you know, I, I was worried about taking on new patients who I didn't really understand the full, you know, the, the full case presentation and what I was dealing with. I was really worried about it. But, you know, I'm a clinician who, if you call me, I always call you back, right? So I, I, if someone was seeking treatment, they call, left message, I would always call them back. And a couple weeks into the self-quarantine, um, I a patient called, and I was, again, not in a space where I thought I'd be taking new patients, but something about him really spoke to me. And I thought, this guy is having a lot of anxiety. He has never had psychological help before. He's a male in his like late 30s, 40s. He's Latino. Like he was seeking treatment. And I, I always feel like as a motivational interviewing person, one of the first things I learned is that someone is seeking something and you can give it to them to engage them, then go ahead and do that. And so I took him on. In fact, I was talking to him about this um, just this week, and and I, you know, I have a very collaborative, very transparent relationship with him, and I, you know, I, I shared that with him, and I was like, I, but I heard that you needed help, and I could probably help you, and so he and I started treatment right away, a couple days later, and he was in such distress with anxiety that he actually needed treatment twice a week, so again, I was worried about the safety and all the risk, and I just did my best, so I, um, I don't know if any of you have taken, I made sure I was, I had taken telehealth like classes, so I felt like ethically I could, I felt comfortable assessing for safety. I knew um, who his emergency contact was. I knew who was at home, where he was, all this stuff. Um, and I went ahead and did it. And it, you know what I found out? And I don't know if anyone else has initiated patients during this time, but it, it honestly, it wasn't very much different than when I do it in person. And that's kind of what I walked away from. If anything, it felt more rewarding because here was this guy who was in such distress and needed help. Um, and really, it, his anxiety was actually just needed, he just needed a little bit of help along the way, a little bit of mindfulness, um, a little bit of exposure therapy within context, because we can't expose you to COVID-19, but he just needed a little bit of shaping around his behavior to get him back on the road to feeling good. Um, and it's been one of the most rewarding patients potentially of my career, because here we are eight weeks later, and he's doing great and he like he we with gratitude because he's feeling so much better and that when we go back to like our sense of purpose of why do i sit here and why do i do what i do it's for people like him who are suffering and struggling and if they don't get the help they need 
they're going to continue to suffer and struggle and potentially come out of the back end of this with a true um, anxiety disorder that's, that's much harder to treat. And so I'm meeting him where he's at. I'm being able to establish rapport. Um, and it, it was, it's been really amazing. Um, and so I'm wondering, like, have, have any of you started, are you doing intake and what, what kind of tricks of the trade do you have to establish rapport remotely? And is it, are you finding it's different about the theme? Um, and if anyone wants to unmute yourself or speak up or put it in the chat. I'm curious how it's going for you guys out there. So while people are thinking about that, Michelle, I'll just add in that my first um, use of the evidence-based practice of motivational interviewing was through um, a pilot study and then a, a little bit bigger randomized control trial eventually. And I, my whole initial foray into motivational interviewing was delivered via the telephone. I never, it, it wasn't until like a decade later that I actually got to use motivational interviewing in a face-to-face -face situation. So my training was actually the opposite where I had to learn to do this style without verbal cues, quote unquote, you get lots of nonverbals over the phone, but um, right. you know, it, 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 it does work. Yeah. <clears throat> And I, I mean, I had to go all the way from intake to to discharge via the telephone. Yeah, it was so. Well, I'm, I'm dating myself. It was too way too long ago that we couldn't use Zoom. Yeah, or if you were like me, you worked in the VA for a while, where even though there was like video, the VA wouldn't let you use it because <laughs> now they do. Um, but there was a long time where we couldn't use video; it was audio only, so only conference calls and that kind of stuff. So it looks like. You know, Patricia is saying she does intake weekly and finds them the same as in the office, right? Which I think is, you know, so I would encourage you, if you're having any anxiety about initiating treatment or doing intakes, I would try it out. Um, so by the way, that, that, um, that case went so well, and after a few sessions of meeting with him, that I've now taken, I think, three other new patients, one of whom is a nurse on the front line. So when she called, I also felt like I couldn't say no to her. I really wanted to help her out and be present for her. Um, you know, another is someone who was positive with COVID-19 and really was having a lot of anxiety. And again, I felt like I couldn't say no. Um, maybe you guys will send me some advice that says stop answering your phone, Michelle, because you can't say no. Um, but, but that's why this is my purpose, right? My purpose and my mission, and that's why we started here, is to help people. Um, and so I say yes within the means I can. And, um, and by the way, I have said no to people. Um, I think there's definitely um, some cases that I think need a higher level of care. Um, or are somewhere where I don't think we could potentially even continue after. Um, like, I would love for even, in fact, my, the one patient I just told you about who I initiated with, who's doing really, doing well, we talk about when, after this will happen, him coming to the office and how amazing it's going to be and to see him in person. And I hope that we do it when we could have a hug, which probably is a long time down the road, right? And so, but it's, but it's thinking about that's the level of rapport that we've built over just a video, right? Just a chat. Okay, so speaking of like, and I know this has come up already a little bit, right, of, you know, definitely the privacy issues. Um, and so actually that patient I just told you about was what, what was so charming about him is he um, was so motivated and so motivated for the treatments. He's so motivated. He does such a great job that he called me initially from his bathroom um, and I'll never forget, like, when we went to go do a mindfulness thing, he went to sit on the floor, and he's, like, in his pajama bottoms. Or, you know, it's just weird seeing our clients in a completely different setting. Um, we're meeting them where they're at. We're getting to see. Um, I, I have one patient that I work with who um, is really kind of had been working for a long time on wanting to move out and move on her own. And would you believe that she signed a lease, and she, her lease started April 1st in the middle of all of this mayhem? And you know what? She went through with it. She moved out. And so now I, now, so I started with her in, her in her other home and now she moved out and she's in her own independent apartment and she got to give me a tour of the apartment. Had we been meeting in person, I would have never seen her apartment. And she was so proud of building these shelves by herself. And it just, it's this amazing thing that's happening. And there's some challenges with privacy. Right. So my one patient calling me from um, his bathroom, other patients, I've had multiple patients calling me from their closet, the 
floor of their closets because it's the only place they feel like is insulated enough where they feel comfortable. Um, lots of patients calling me from their cars, meaning they go out from their cars. Um, and I've even gone on a few walking sessions with patients um, so that, you know, if they really don't have a space where they feel like comfortable within their home or they they take me on a walk. And so then we do an audio only, right, so that they can go ahead and take a walk. And then it's kind of a win-win, right? They're getting in a little bit of behavioral activation. Um, maybe we even do a mindful walk while we're out there, right, and really kind of just leverage that opportunity. Um but I'm wondering any like interesting stories from um, privacy related from your patients or anything that any curious locations or fun stuff that where you you've seen patients. The other thing while we're waiting for you can enter in some answers or maybe maybe you don't have any fun stories yet. I hope you do. Um, but I definitely have, in addition to people getting to meet my dogs, I've gotten to meet friends, like friends and, well, friends and colleagues' dogs, but I've also gotten to meet patients' dogs. Cats often make, like, appearances on telehealth <laughs> sessions, which is kind of fun. Um, like, lots of strange, I mean, I definitely have met kids. So if, like, a, you know, a toddler shows up and wants to say hi and then like leave it's kind of fun um it's definitely like it there is something that's really there are some challenges to privacy and then there's something that's really um charming and intimate about meeting your patient literally where they are right and even maybe seeing around their space and seeing some of the challenges that they have um you know showing like showing you things that they might have just told you about before um yeah, and it sounds like doing a session from someone in their garage due to privacy. Um, one of my neighbors was hanging out in the car the other day and not talking, and I was like, oh, I wonder if she's on her therapy session. And I wanted to be like, knock on the window and be like, I know what you're doing. Um, but I didn't. Um, but I was like, that's, that's the, the car is such a safe space. Um, but I loved what someone said earlier too of um, that we what we really do is sometimes we get to peer into their world and we see some of the dynamics within relationships that that helps us really understand what's going on. So I've had a patient that's been interrupted a couple times by his partner during sessions, um, and like I could see the interruption and then I see how he deals with it and it's just like here it is in vivo. The, the what he tells me about, like I've actually gotten to experience it. Okay. Yeah, and really see his reactions and see his like how he re you know like how he deals with that, what what that's really like for him, and being able to reflect that, like watching that all unfold. Right. Yeah, it's very telling, right, in a different way than it's actually like, and speaking of like mindfulness, it's sort of a great transition for that, right, because it's happening in the moment. Um, and so we could really have that, like, tell me what's going on with your mind now. What was that like for you? Um, you know, talk me through it. Um, and so it's, it's really kind of managing those challenges. Um, <laughs> I love it. Every time I call a client, um, his 85-year-old mom answers. <laughs> Um, that's kind of fun, right? It's 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 a different it's a different view that we get. Um, so I'm not sure how many of you do mindfulness. I so I'm a big proponent of mindfulness. I've been doing incorporating mindfulness into my practice for a very long time, including with motivational interviewing. And so I think about motivational interviewing as very like again, it's, you know, you need to be really present and centered and listening. Um, you know, I'm trying to even do my best as we're talking today to not pay too much attention to the chat box because that would be distracting to me. So when I have a second, I'll maybe look down and I know I, Laura's got my back, so I don't even have to, she's my, she's my mindfulness for the chat box. Um, but really staying present, um, helping, I, I love doing mindfulness with patients. I really feel like it helps ground them, um, really just doing some breathing, centering them, um, helping to slow things down. Um, and really be present in the moment. And I'll, so I do mindfulness a variety of ways on telehealth. Um, I will play something off of my phone. And so if you guys don't know, this is like a, hopefully you know, but, but I'm going to say it just in case you don't, but 10% happier and Headspace. And there might even be another app that are offering free access to um, healthcare providers. And so 10% happier, which I, so believe it or not, I'm such a proponent of 10% happier. Um, that I actually paid for it. 
so so I didn't I, I can't get it free um I love it they have an amazing COVID-19 section where you can and so I will just go ahead and pick something in advance if I if there's lots of great opportunities on there to different so take a look at it um feel free to message me if you forget or whatever or have any questions but I'll go ahead and take it and then I'll just put it up to my microphone and I'll sit and you know what I do? I do it with them because having five minutes of mindfulness is great for everybody. Um, and so I may do that. I don't do it in every session. It's depending on whether it's indicated or not. Um, the other thing I've done is a lot of times with anxiety, um, there's all kinds of psychosomatic, there's all kinds of somatic symptoms that come up. And so I had one patient who was having a hard time swallowing like his anxiety was causing some difficulty and some tension in the back of his throat and he was having a hard time swallowing. And I, that's not the first time I've had a patient do that. And so, but it, but if I was in person, I have raisins in my office and I do the classic raisin mindfulness exercise. I have other stuff in my office. I keep Jolly Ranchers. We'll do some kind of mindful eating exercise. And here I am sitting on the other side of a camera and I'm like, this is the intervention that I know how to do that works really well. What am I going to do? And I started to just, I asked him, like, do you have any reasons? He was like, no, I have grapes. And I was like, oh, um, I didn't think a grape would work as well. And I was like, how about, he's like, strawberry? I'm like, perfect. I was like, pause, like I'm going to put you on mute. You go to your kitchen, get a strawberry. I'm going to go to my kitchen and get a strawberry. And we did a strawberry mindfulness eating intervention together. And he was able to eat the strawberry successfully. So I walked him through it. And so it's just, it's sometimes we're thinking on our feet. Um, and going back to being exhausting, that is exhausting, right? And I think, I actually think doing motivational interviewing and, and treatment in general really well is exhausting in general because your attention is so focused. But here I'm trying to like figure out, okay, here's my toolbox that I might normally like hand you something that I can't do virtually. So how do I pivot and move that to a more innovative approach? And in this case, it just meant we both took a couple of minutes and got something to eat so that we could walk through that exercise together. So you can play and uh, play something from your phone. It looks like um, Matthew said, yeah, YouTube videos are great too. And so you can share your screen depending on what platform you're using to do that. Um, and so it's really there again, being creative and innovative to really think about um, delivering not just mindfulness, but any intervention that you used to do face to face that felt like um, it was really helpful and meaningful to you figuring out how to pivot that to remote. The other thing I would say before I forget is I, I don't know how many of you use the values card exercise in motivational interviewing or in general because I use it across a lot of interventions. Yeah, love it. Um, Therapist Aid, um, which is a website, has an interactive values exercise that you can share your screen. Um, and patients pick the values, and then it walks them through an exercise of rank ordering them, um, and then asking them how much they're living into their values. And so it's actually this really neat exercise that I had never utilized before because I've always done the values card sort with my patients in person. Um, and so this is a nice opportunity to do something more interactive um, and creative within within session. I know those of you that probably see um, like younger kids or adolescents, like it's nice to have something to keep them engaged within the session um, and keep them tracking you. And it also helps you track with them. Okay. Um, I think we've, we've hit on this, um, you know, what a great picture about sort of the intimacy that you um, are having access to. So you're seeing them, you're seeing their space, Patients are calling in in their pajamas, they're calling in from their bed, from their closet, from their bathroom. You might be meeting partners and dogs. You know, we are really just, I feel, so this is for, this is for me personally, a huge silver lining of doing telehealth is the, the level of intimacy that you have access to um, within, within the framework of being able to see them, right? So they can walk you around um, and, and really being able to include um, even others into the treatment, which we'll talk about in a, sec a second. Laura, any other thoughts on this one? Intimacy. I feel like we covered them in other, and I'm I'm sensitive to the time. We have about 10 minutes left. Yeah, I do. I think we covered it from both the perspective of the person delivering the person and environment. Yeah, yeah, both both ends. Yeah. Yep. Awesome. 
Okay. This is another one. Um, so we talked about how getting patients to sessions feels a little bit easier now, right? Because it kind of removes a lot of the barriers. The other thing is most people are sheltering in place with their significant others. Um, and so doing um, couples work has become a little bit easier in some ways because they're, they're there, they both can come in. You also, no, I would never, so this is sort of a watch out, right? I wouldn't want someone to be like, oh, like bring someone on board just because they happen to be there. But if there's clinically relevant reason to bring someone in to get some information, um, I don't know um, with those of you who, um, you know, are seeing, but I, there's a lot of tension happening in relationships, right? Because people are like stuck at home, roles are changing, there's a lot of role tension. Um, and so I do a lot of couple therapy, but I also do kind of the unilateral couple therapy where you're working with one person, but you're helping them. But if they wanted to, and you would do, you know, you could do consenting and really be careful about that piece. But now it's, now there's an option that makes it potentially easier to do where you can include others and do family work. Um, you know, and it depends on your platform of, how easily you can include others. Um, but any other thoughts about, has anyone done any couples work or found, found any you know, silver linings with people sheltering in place with others in their home? Okay. Well, we can kind of let, I, I, I just saw um, Pamela's question about compromising the clients who really don't want to use telehealth to avoid losing them together. I, um, I don't know, Pamela, what you're talking about with a hybrid session. That's, I'm not sure, I don't know, Pamela, if you can unmute and we could chat about it for a second, or you can put it in the text box. Oh, I'm sorry, yes, but, yeah, okay. So Terry was mentioning, I think this is a silver lining that when you're working with children, parents are now more involved because they're there helping them with the technology. So in terms of including others, but then then Pamela's question kind of came in before that. I think it's a great question. Right. In fact, I was writing it down to, to make sure it didn't get lost in the chat. So I can just start and Pamela, if, you, if you're oh. able to, um, unmute or clarify what you mean by hybrid sessions. Um, but I, here's where I think this is a great opportunity to use motivational interviewing, right? Is to really see like, what are some of the good things about using telehealth? What are some of the not so good things? And how can you, and, and it, you know, it all depends because we're talking nationally, right? It all depends on where you sit and what your local guidelines are, right? About um, how you're doing therapy. So and whether you want to do something in person, I also saw like up above in the chat, there was someone asking about like visiting your you know, longer term patients and seeing them from social distancing. I think it's really whatever guidelines and whatever you're comfortable with. I'll tell you that one of the things that I've been thinking about is, um, and because, you know, again, re remembering that I'm so close to New York and so that's that definitely in where the hotbed of COVID-19. And so I think about when I go back, I'm imagining that the first step in going back might actually be like face masks. Kind of stuff and I frankly I'd rather do this where I can see and see what's going on than sit across from my patient in person with a face mask on or like meeting them with a face mask and having to like clean I you know I um clean where they sit after every time they're there worrying about the door not like to me this creates a level of anxiety and stress that like I feel like it, the silver lining here is that I'm more protected that's a huge silver lining that that piece of doing our work is removed um, and so it's, you know, thinking about, um, but if someone does need their own space, like, um, you know, it's, it's a challenge, right? And so you have to figure out for yourself within, um, what makes the most sense and how you can protect yourself and your patients, um, and do the good work that you really are motivated to do. Well, and exploring with that person who is, um, really eschewing the, 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 um, telehealth, is it a, is it a technology issue? Is it is it a preference issue? Like, what is it about the meeting tele, te, you know, through telehealth mechanisms that's really like a no go for this person? And is it possible that there could be some adjustments? And that might be what you meant, Pamela, about hybrid. But is there something that you can do to fix it up? Because the other thing mm -hmm. that I was thinking about, Michelle, when you were talking, is you know, what are we going to do if we go back to face to face? 
and you and your client have a different idea about what social distancing, the power of social distancing, and or whether or not we should be wearing face masks, or, I mean, there's a lot of um, very strong feelings around that and very strong um, grounding and, you know, what, what people's reasons are for wanting to take those precautions or not, and how difficult that would be to have that kind of a philosophical difference with somebody who's supposed to be your client. Right. No, no, I think, and it, that's a great point, right, of how do you figure that out. Um, and Pamela just wrote that the hybrid would be one way telehealth, one way. I think that's, I think it's really up to you and your, your setting, right, so what makes the most sense for you all. I mean, I'll, I'll be honest, I live in a small town, um, so my town is three square miles, and I, like, if I go for a run, I run past, like, probably, like, three or four of my patients have, right, easily, <laughs> like, they're on my, like, route. And I always think about how nice it would be to see them. And, you know, and so it's, and I think about, well, could we do it? Like, how safely could we do it? Could we do it outside? Um, I have one patient who has a lot of social anxiety, and I worry that the longer he shelters in place, the worse it's going to get. And so actually, like, clinically, I kind of want to get him out of his house. Um, and so I've been thinking about he's someone that, like, I could probably find somewhere that's safe and private to meet, potentially outdoors or something. Um, but I think you've got to think about it individually for, for everyone. There's no right answers here. I, this is the thing that, like, I think we all need to come to some, like, acceptance. Right? There's no, like, rule book, no book on how to move through a pandemic, right, in our current environment and setting. And so we've got to just do the best we can with consistent with our values. Um, you know, and Laura, I think that's a great point, right? Like, everyone sort of thinks differently about social distancing and, um, and, you know, and how careful you have to be. And I see that even within my own, like, tiny neighborhood that I'm in. Um, so before we run out of time, I realize that, like, we're, we're at the, we only have a few more minutes. Um, but I kind of, we thought about kind of wrapping this up and thinking about, you know, there really are some silver linings. Um, and part of what we're seeing is, you know, I think in one of the phone calls that Laura or I were on, um, one of the um, motivational learning trainers was reporting that in her um, clinical world that they were reporting like a drastic reduction in no shows because we were removing all of the barriers to getting or many of the barriers to getting to treatment. Um, and so should we should we advocate to keep telehealth as an option? Um, what would you advocate for? What do you think? And, and based on your own comfort level, but also what you're seeing therapeutically, um, you know, I'm wondering if we could just open up the lines and or the chat box. Um, Oh, I love, you know, Elizabeth being able to continue with clients if they move out of town. I think that that's fantastic. Um, it gets a little dicey with state lines, right, depending on where you're licensed. Um, but, you know, that would be really interesting. I, I think the other one, just to kind of piggyback on that, is when we have, we have uh, kids who go to college, right? And when they go off to college, like, I, I, how stinky is it, right, that they work with us and then they go off to college, they work with someone else and they come back home. They, you know, it's like, the continuity of treatment might be so much more effective for them if they could just stay with one clinician and whether it's their clinician at college or us, but like having that ability to stay with someone via telehealth. Other things that you're thinking about that you would advocate for? I think this advocacy role is going to become really important as we look to think about, well, what adjustments were made in haste to facilitate us to be able to do telehealth that we then want to advocate for, that we want to be able to have either data or anecdotal stuff about, well, let's, let's not undo this good that happened as a result of, as I described it in the beginning, being thrust into this. So do we need to make um, adjustments in laws of, about cross-state um, being able to deliver cross state? Do we need to make uh, adjustments in payer schedules based on what they're pay reimbursing for telehealth versus in person? Um, that kind of stuff. Because I do think there's, there's certainly, we're certainly learning that there are some clients who are better served and what is our role in advocating for those people um, to continue some of this stuff. Yeah, and I just saw that, you know, Judy mentioned that the client can't make it for transportation or babysitter. And I think about, you know, when this all started, there was a bunch of articles that said, like, this isn't a snow day, right? Because everyone was like, oh, this is like a snow day. 
Um, and, you know, this isn't a snow day. This was a long term challenge. And look at how far we've come in the ability to meet people where they're at, to deliver good evidence based practices over a telehealth platform. And so even if there is a snow day going forward, we can still see our patients. They don't have to miss out um, on their treatment. Um, and I don't know about you guys, but like old snow days, it's kind of like, oh, we used to have to cancel and then squish everyone in and maybe we'd miss some people and miss a week. Now we can have continuity of treatment. Um, and yes, there's a downside because it's in a snow day, kind of a fun day, right? Like it's nice to have that breather, um, but thinking through, well, you know, how can we manage this and what can we really keep keep available and um, for telehealth. And I, I don't know the settings that you guys work on, work in, but um, I know a lot of, like, I think about even my daughter's school, right? They weren't set up for remote learning. And within, like, by the end of the first week, like, teachers were on Google Classroom teaching. And a lot of people weren't set up for telehealth, that they quickly move, mobilized. And so now that we have the ability in place and privacy um, is fairly protected. I think the, you know, there's a sky is the limit um, to how we can keep this and really thinking about, you know, what would that even that hybrid be um, of being able to meet patients where they're at. Okay, so I know ooh, we're at time. So, we're at time. Yeah, we're at time. So um, thank you so much for participating. We had a nice really great large group of people. You were super participatory. And um, throughout the um, workshop, there were several resources mentioned. Um, Michelle and I will put together a list of those resources and share that out with the whole group as soon as we get that together in the next couple days. So, and I think right after this survey, right after this, a survey will pop up. We really would appreciate you taking one minute to do that survey. It's how we're able to do these kind of workshops for free. SAMHSA keeps throwing money into our coffers if we uh, give them the data that they want about <laughs> who participated and did you like it? So thank you for taking a little bit of time to do that.